Micah was a country boy who lived in an age much like ours. Those of you who have been with us in our Wednesday evening studies will remember the studies about Ahab and Jezebel, their wicked daughter Ahaziah, the union that Ahab made with Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. You recall the, I'm sorry, Athaliah was the daughter, Ahaziah was the son. A wicked union that Jehoshaphat made with Ahab. You will also recall that Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, succeeded him and led Israel into horrible, and Judah into horrible sin. It was during this time that God raised up a country boy named Micah as one of the minor prophets to bring a peculiar message to his people. Bear in mind that he was living in an age of anarchy. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Micah gives us more insight, I think, to the Messiah than perhaps any of the minor prophets. He advocates the coming Messiah as the hope of Israel, the hope of Judah, and the hope of the world, and the hope of individuals. He even gives us a little light we have not received hitherto, in that he tells us that the Savior, the Messiah, will be born in Bethlehem of Judah. He summarizes his admonitions to God's people living in a horrible age. Someone asked me tonight, do you think that there is more fanaticism and, um, I forget the other word they used, but something like that, in our age than there ever has been before? No, no. The devil never gets anything new. He just gets the old over and over and over again. That's all. Uh, the world has been wicked, as wicked before as it is tonight. In the time of, um, of um, Micah, under the reign of the wicked king Jehoram, the son of the pussyfoot and Jehoshaphat, Judah went into horrible sin. And Micah stands before the people of God and says now God, to God's people, What does the Lord require of thee? In an age of anarchy, in an age of idolatry, in an age of sensuality, in an age of profanity, in an age of rebellion, what does God require of His people? He writes these words, and I'll read them to you. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings with calves of a year old? Is that what God wants from you, asked Micah? You, His people who live in this awful age, is that what you think God wants from you, offer calves on a burnt altar? Now, let me make, make it very plain, very plain. God is interested or was interested in their offering sacrifices. He is not saying we ought to serve God with our heart, hearts in the place of sacrifices. He's saying we ought to serve God with our heart while we sacrifice. Sometimes folks get a little wild and say, Well, the church is dead and the services are dead. I don't believe in going to church. Now, you're just as wrong as a dead church is. Uh, what God is saying is this, when he said, when Amos said, for example, I hate, I despise your smelly offerings. They come up into my nostrils. They make me sick. God isn't saying don't worship. He's saying add sincerity to your worship. He's saying go ahead and worship. Go ahead and go to church. Go ahead and give sacrifices. But do it out of a heart of sincerity. Verse 7 says, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? As you know, the Jews, in their religion, used the anointing oil as a part of their religion. There was the oil of the tabernacle, the golden candlestick, and the tabernacle in the house of God. There was the anointing oil that was, was, was uh, uh, placed on the head of the priest and, uh, and poured on the head of the high priest. And there were the uh, sacrifices, and the Lord says, uh, 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 He says, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? No, no, that won't do it. Or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? No, that won't do it. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Notice the, the, the progression here. He says that uh, without sincerity and without righteousness, does it do any good to offer lambs? No. Do any good to offer bullocks? No. 
What if you have 10,000 rams? No good at all. What if you have 10,000 rivers of oil with which to anoint the priest? Won't do a bit of good of oil. Of all, of all. What if the oil fills the candlestick and we have bushels and barrels? You know, bushels of oil, do you? Barrels of it. Uh, uh, does that do any good? No, it won't do any good. Listen to me. God wants sincerity in worship and service. And God will look most anything other than insincerity. And uh, so he says in verse 7, verse 8, He has showed the old man what is good, and what doth the Lord require thee? In 1973, with communism coming like a black cloud over our nation, what does God require of us? With the Playboy philosophy, and every stand, magazine stand almost, and almost every drugstore having nude ladies on the front of the magazine, what does God require of us in 1973? He requires the same thing of us. He's always required of His people. By the way, these aren't requests of God. These are requirements of God. These aren't suggestions from God. These are requirements by God. What are they? One, do justly. What else? Love mercy. What else? Walk humbly with the Lord or with our God. Now, I want to just list these for a few minutes. By the way, you ought to know what these are. These requirements. These are not suggestions from a friend. These are orders from a commander. This is God saying, I require you. And every person in this house tonight is required by God in this age to do these three things. What's first? Do justly. What does it mean to do justly? It means give everyone, everyone what's his. That's what it means. Give everyone what's his. It means punish wrong, honor right, vindicate justice. Do justly. That's the first thing. Give everyone what's his. Now, I want to just list a few of these tonight, and I want you to listen carefully, because I'm going to get down to where you live before it's over. What does it mean to do justly? The first step in doing just, justly is being saved. That's the first thing. Nobody can be just unless he's saved. He can be the head of the Supreme Court, but he's not a, he won't be a, a Supreme Court justice unless he's saved. He may, nobody, nobody can live without God and live and a life are not saved and do justice. Nobody. Do justly. Nobody. Uh, actually, do you know a person who's not saved is a thief? A dirty, crooked thief. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you're a filthy robber. I mean you're crooked. I mean you're not honest. I mean you couldn't be trusted. I mean I wouldn't let you borrow any money. You say, well, I'm honest. No, you're not honest either. You're a crook. You're a double crook. You're a double thief. Well, you say, what do you mean? I mean this. I mean that God in heaven made you. He it is who gave you the breath of life to live. God spoke and made man. God made you. And when you do not give yourself back to the God who made you, you're crooked, you're a thief, you're a robber. I wouldn't trust you. You're dishonest. I mean, that's, that's one reason why, un why liberals are dishonest. Don't be surprised a man that doesn't believe the Bible is crooked too. Don't be surprised a man's dishonest who's not saved. Why? Because a man who's not saved is taking something that God made and is rightly God. God didn't make you so you go out and get rich and have fun and eat three square meals a day and drive a Cadillac car. God didn't make you so you could live it up and have pleasure and have a, a girlfriend or a wife and kids and a nice house. God made you to fellowship with Himself. And if you're not in communion with your God, you're crooked. I mean, you're dishonest. I mean, you are a thief. I mean, you are a common robber. I mean, you ought to be in the penitentiary. Because you're stealing something that's not yours. Why, you say, preacher, I'll have you know, it's my life. I can live it like I want to live it. No, you've got a hole in your head. It's not your life. It's God's life. God made you. But that isn't all. You're a double crook and a double thief because God not only made you, but he bought you. Jesus Christ went to the cross and paid for your soul and paid for your redemption and paid the price for your sins. And if you sit here tonight and you've never yet made it right with God, you've never looked to your Maker and said, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, and give my life to you. I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior from sin. If you've never done that, you are not walking justly. You are not doing justly. You're dishonest. You're a thief. You're a robber. And you're a crook. The old story that I've told again and again, but it's so beautifully illustrative at this point. Is the one that ever preacher, I guess, who's ever preached this, told again and again and again about the little boy who one day took his knife and a little piece of wood and made a boat. He did a splendid job of making that boat. He was so proud of it. He took that boat down to the seashore and uh, the ocean and began to play in the water with that little boat. 
He'd, he'd let the boat ride the waves, and he'd go out and get it, and the boat would ride away. He'd go out and bring it back, and let it ride a while longer. He was so proud of that little boat. But one day the tide went out, and that little boy's boat was too far from him. He ran to get the boat and couldn't find it. The boat was taken out into the ocean. The little boy stood on the ocean weeping and saying, I made the boat, and it's mine, and I want it, and I don't know. My boat's gone, it's gone. He went home and said, Mother, my boat's gone. I made my boat, and it's gone. His heart was broken. Soon uh, the wound was healed and the scar was, was revealed, but the little boy still remembered the little boat. One day he was walking down the street and he passed a toy shop and he saw that little boat. He thought his own little boat in the toy shop. The little boy went, ran inside and said, Mr. Kadassi, 